cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were selected as targets after exhaustive study by military specialists, blast experts, and weather consultants. An air burst at about 1,800 feet was decided upon to minimize the lingering effects of radiation by dissipation of the bomb products in the atmosphere and to achieve maximum blast effect. Comprehensive studies by Japanese and by allied scientists were made at the end of the war in both ruined cities. Damage from blast and from primary fires generated by the heat was unparalleled. Buildings collapsed, electrical systems were shorted, stoves overturned. A wave of secondary fires resulted, adding to the Holocaust. Flash burns from primary heat waves caused most of the casualties to inhabitants. Others were burned when their homes burst ablaze. Blast pressure and flying debris caused many injuries. Highly penetrating radiation from the nuclear explosion had a heavy casualty effect. A fire storm with winds of from 30 to 40 knots followed the blast at Hiroshima as air was drawn to the center of the burning area. Sheltering hills caused Nagasaki to be spared the secondary effect of a fire storm, although severe fires resulted from the blast. At first glance, damage at Hiroshima seemed more spectacular than that at Nagasaki, but comprehensive investigation told a different tale. Trees toppled at Hiroshima were uprooted. At Nagasaki, trees were violently snapped off at their bases. The radius of severe damage at Nagasaki was greater than at Hiroshima. Gamma radiation and neutrons caused thousands of cases of radiation sickness in Japan. First, the blood was affected, and then were impaired the blood-making organs, the bone marrow, the spleen, and the lymph nodes. Irradiation killed the young and immature lymphocytes. Germinal centers disappeared. The lymph glands decreased in size, leaving only walls and partitions. Blood would not coagulate and oozed through unbroken skin or seeped into many of the interior body cavities. Next, internal organs such as lungs, intestines, the liver or the kidneys were affected and their functions destroyed. When the irradiation was severe, organs became necrotic within a few days, marking the victim for certain death within a short interval. When the irradiation was moderate, many persons lingered from two to six weeks before the onset of death. Slight irradiation, when it did not cause death, often produced internal effects which lingered for months. Many persons who escaped both blast injury and burns were cut down from seemingly blooming health by the insidious radiation. Frequent symptoms of radiation sickness were exhaustion, then bleeding or high fever. As gamma rays took effect, rescuer often died before the person he had rescued. Surveys disclosed that severe radiation injury occurred to all exposed persons within a radius of one kilometer. Serious to moderate radiation injury occurred between one and two kilometers. Persons within two and four kilometers suffered slight radiation effects. When the war with Japan ended, a great mass of information about the atomic bomb had been gathered. But after the explosions at Alamogordo, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, much scientific information was still incomplete. Lacking was significant information about blast efficiency, nuclear radiation, spectra, time developments, and thermal, magnetic, oceanographic, meteorological, seismic, and biological effects. There had been scant opportunity to obtain, by careful measurement, the multiple data required for complete statistics. Unavoidable lack of special instruments, lack of time, and loss of some instruments due to unpredictable factors had diminished results at Alamogordo. At Hiroshima and Nagasaki, too few measurements of radiation or pressure were made, and data on injury to personnel, while extensive, were far from complete. Physicians often did not know what type of injuries they were treating. The injured received little or no medical treatment, and trivial injuries often became serious. Methods of treatment were inadequately developed. Correlation of damage and injury data with pressure and radiation data was a subject on which more accurate information was essential. Physical effects of atomic explosion near or under water were entirely unknown. Information on all characteristics of atomic explosion was essential and could be obtained only under carefully controlled conditions. 
Medical reports needed amplification, especially with respect to the effects of radiation on personnel under varied conditions and the extent of radiation from bombs exploded under different circumstances. New bombing techniques had to be developed and new bombing tables worked out to meet the exacting requirements of this new weapon. The effects of atomic bombs on all types of military equipment demanded study. Beyond question, post-war research, design, and expenditures for national defense would be gravely affected. Only two atomic bombs had been used against the enemy. Both were aerial bursts in which the bomb was detonated above land targets. The effects of atomic bombs on ships in both aerial and underwater explosions must be explored to elicit and evaluate fundamental information. Application of information obtained to naval design, tactics, and strategy was essential to national security. Sea power has played a vital role in our destiny as a nation. It was important to know if and how the basic concepts of sea power were to be affected by weapons radically new. All this information was paramount in planning experimental work, in developing the effectiveness of the bomb, and in seeking to discover measures of defense. We could afford to be ignorant of no aspect of the bomb. In the light of this unsatisfactory situation, proposals were made to conduct controlled tests with atomic bombs to obtain all possible information. A program of large-scale controlled tests of other modern weapons had already been projected. The use of the atomic bomb as the implement to produce graded structural damage was expedient because it permitted the combination of damage analysis with studies of atomic effects. Individual proposals to conduct atomic bomb tests had come from General Arnold, Commanding General of the Army Air Forces, and from Vice Admiral E.L. Cochran, Chief of the Bureau of Ships, and Vice Admiral G.F. Hussey, Jr., Chief of the Bureau of Ordnance. Leading legislators and Manhattan Engineer District agreed that full-scale tests must be undertaken. As early as 1944, it had been planned to use the atomic bomb against the Japanese fleet at Truk. But by the time the bomb had been developed, the base at Truk was no longer strategically important in the Pacific War. After the war, many proposals to use Japanese vessels as targets for atomic tests were advanced. Such proposals aimed at obtaining required information and at the same time eliminating Japanese naval power completely. It was soon obvious that tests against enemy vessels alone would not develop sufficient information. Basic differences in ship design and tactical policy between the United States and other navies rendered the use of some American vessels imperative. Because our attitude has been traditionally defensive rather than offensive, we needed to discover how United States ships would fare under atomic attack. We needed to re-examine the principle that ship design be matched to tactical function and similar tenets of naval doctrine. The shortcomings of comparative tests with miniature models and conventional explosives were equally obvious. Basic data must be derived from effects of the bomb on existing designs and structure. With such information at hand, model tests could then be continued and experimental work intelligently prosecuted. It was first necessary to formulate the so-called damage law for this new explosive with respect to ship targets and their orientation to blast. On October 16, 1945, Fleet Admiral Ernest J. King proposed that the atomic tests be controlled by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. A committee headed by Major General LeMay of the Army Air Forces was directed to make studies and recommendations. Result of these staff studies was creation of Joint Task Force One. With the approval of President Truman, Vice Admiral William H.P. Blandy, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Special Weapons was designated commander of the task force. The Joint Chiefs of Staff approved the code name suggested by Admiral Blandy, and the venture was christened Operation Crossroads. Admiral Blandy was directed to organize a joint staff with adequate representation of the land, naval, and air forces, and with an integrated representation of civilian scientists. Major General William E. Kepner, one of the Army Air Force's top generals became the deputy task force commander for aviation. 
Rear Admiral William S. Parsons, who had been associate director of the Los Alamos Laboratory when the first atomic bombs were made, was named deputy task force commander for technical direction. He was the Enola Gaze weaponeer on the historic flight of that B-29 to Hiroshima. Rear Admiral T.A. Salberg, director of research and standards in the Bureau of Ships and deputy member of the Tolman Committee for Applications of Nuclear Energy, became director of ship material. Major General McAuliffe, who scorned demands of superior German forces for surrender of his embattled 101st Airborne Division at Bastogne, was appointed ground forces advisor. Dr. Ralph A. Sawyer, now dean of the Graduate School of the University of Michigan and veteran in the field of applied physics, became the top civilian scientist on the staff. Around this core of men, Joint Task Force One was built. The Joint Task Force was charged with determining the effects of atomic explosives against naval vessels and equipment in order that strategic implications might be appraised. The directive further ordered that full advantage be taken of the opportunities to gain information on effects of atomic explosions on aircraft and on Army ground equipment, and that all possible data of scientific value be compiled. Secretary Forrestal authorized retention of 158 surplus United States naval vessels for the experiment. Meanwhile, Fleet Admiral Nimitz had saved important Japanese warships from routine destruction and a choice of these vessels was offered the task force. The Prinz Eugen, modern German cruiser, was earmarked for the tests. The task force commander was directed to procure administrative and logistic support directly from the War and Navy Departments, and on matters concerning the bombs to deal directly with Manhattan Engineer District. Assembly of the task force called for coordinated activity by many agencies of the government, notably the Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, State Department, Department of Interior, United States Public Health Service, Smithsonian Institution, Department of Commerce, and the Department of Agriculture. Personnel problems were critical. Highly skilled technicians were particularly hard to obtain. In spite of these facts, Joint Task Force One mushroomed into a highly integrated force of 42,000 with a staff that included more than 550 scientists and engineers. The experiments outlined were to comprise the greatest field tests ever undertaken. Because conduct of the tests would be governed by seasonal weather conditions in the South Pacific, a race against time began. The intricate operation was laid out in minute detail by the operations officer for Joint Task Force One. A planning board met daily to integrate proposals from units scattered over the United States and the Pacific Theater. Even while the master plan was being prepared, preliminary activity was underway at a hundred points on the globe, blending coordinated field groups into one great unit. One of the first problems was choice of a site for the tests. The basic requirement called for a protected anchorage six miles in diameter in an unpopulated region of the world but less than 1,000 miles from a B-29 base. The site had to be free from violent storms, must have predictable winds directionally uniform, and predictable currents of great lateral and vertical dispersion. It must have a temperate climate. The site should be remote from fishing grounds, steamer lanes, and inhabited shores, and must be controlled by the United States. After much consideration, a little-known spot in the Marshall Islands was selected. Bikini Atoll, a dot on the map of the mid-Pacific, was destined to become a focal point for the eyes of the world. Situated 11 degrees 31 minutes north, 165 degrees 34 minutes east, Bikini met all requirements, except that its population of 167 persons had to be evacuated and that its lagoon was inadequately charted. Commodore Wyatt visited the island and asked the natives to assist in preserving world peace by allowing their island to be used in the experiments. Even though this meant leaving their ancestral home, perhaps forever, the natives of Bikini were willing to do their share. Family heads selected Ronjerick, an atoll 128 miles to the east, as first choice for a place of resettlement. Construction battalion units, with the help of 22 Bikini natives, began work at Ronjerick. There were problems of delicate diplomacy in providing just the right number of new houses, just the right number of coconut trees, just the right number of water cisterns. 